Dakshesh, that's been a very interesting journey for you uh, from being a banker, being employed in the banking industry. You got into the business mode in the last few years, a decade or more, and you utilized your banking knowledge to become an entrepreneur. What made you take the decision of becoming an entrepreneur? Uh, firstly, good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to, to explain myself and what I've been doing. I mean, as a banker, I think, you know, you have a responsibility uh, to society. And I think 2008 was the defining moment when we had the financial crash. And, you know, when you look back at that and you look at the excess and how we've forgotten society and our role in society and how important banking really is, uh, was a defining moment for me. Uh, and, and the step was really to come out of that and actually develop a payment service that looked at the unbanked sector particularly and, and find a solution that dealt with financial inclusion. When you decided your business plan, you defined your business spanning a couple of countries, some countries in Africa, now you are also concentrating on India. Uh, what made you decide those countries? What was the study that you did before you decided to venture into those countries for your business model? And what is your current business model? I think it, it started from a need, um, and we started in Africa to begin with, because Africa, unlike anywhere else in the world, if you look at the remittance market, um, you know, globally there's something like $700 billion that travels between different countries. India is by far the largest. Um, the cost, just to give an example, into India is about 3 to 4 percent today. Africa is 12 percent. You know, so it's a super tax that the average person in Africa is actually paying. So that pain point is what we want to try and solve, that, you know, how do you remove that pain point of people that are earning decent livings, you know, living abroad, so migrants, diaspora, going to the Gulf, coming into Europe, working and just sending a simple living home. Their families that are destitute really need income because they don't have jobs, um, and they're paying the super tax. And I think when you look at G20, G20's mission was that you know, around the world it should come down to 5% in the next five years. And so we wanted to start our journey in, in solving that particular problem. So Dakshesh is in the fintech services where he made sure that his banking knowledge gets converted into a business model with the help of technology and he created an online platform connecting multiple countries and taking advantage of a pain that he saw in the industry which became his business opportunity. Uh, Dakshesh, when you started this, you were a man with accounting background. You brought technical expertise on board. Uh, when you made your business plan, what were the basic parameters that you put together to make sure that the journey that you are going to take on is the right one? I think you've got to have the right vision. Uh, you've got to have the right problem that you're trying to solve. And I think the, the key for us when we started Zimpe was social consciousness. It was having that conviction and that belief that you could actually drive that change. To, to do that, you know, like earlier in the panel we were talking about getting people joining from MNCs, why would they come into a startup company, etc. And I think it's important that you how do we assemble a team that was actually going to um, deliver against this particular promise, if you like. Uh, so coming from banking itself, it was about trust to begin with. And it's that trust that you've got to build within the team they're trying to build uh, around you, if you like. So we start with four people, blank sheet of paper, and you need an enormous amount of patience. How did you make them believe in your vision? I think it was starting with that pain point, that, you know, that, that social value of what we're trying to deliver. And it was finding people that had the same mindset, if you like. It wasn't about making a fortune. It wasn't about making money at the outset. It was about how do we solve this particular problem. And what I did find very quickly was that, you know, conviction itself can bring the right people to you. You don't need to go look for them. They actually do find you. What is the risk analysis mechanism that you adapted before you started your enterprise? I think uh, the, the risk analysis was looking at the, uh, the market itself. So if, we, if we started in India, which is by far the largest market, probably it would have been a very difficult challenge to overcome. You know, very significant investment. Uh, if you take modern examples of digital India with Paytm, you know, to compete against juggernauts like that, you look at China with what Tencent, uh, WeChat and, and Alipay has done, you know, those are markets that, whilst they're very significant, we couldn't actually play in. But the one market we knew very well, having grown up there, having worked there, and having significant corporate relationships there, particularly in the banking industry, was Africa. And so for us, it was a very low, 
barrier to cross, if you like. Um, the second challenge was actually dealing with the regulation. Um, and quite often, Africa is seen as a country where you can't venture, or a continent you can't venture. Difficulty with issues around corruption, how do you get through regulation? And strangely enough, we actually picked Zimbabwe as our first country, because it actually met all the conditions for banking standards that exist here, exist in a country like that, which is quite difficult to understand and people to believe. The other reason we wanted to go there was that if you, if you could solve a problem in the most difficult country that the world doesn't want to do business with, then it's very easy to translate that anywhere else you go. Money movement has become very difficult, especially in the past two decades. Every, every dollar traveling any, across, any place across the world has been monitored very closely and pretty strictly. How do you ensure that all the rules and regulations that are required by various countries, depending on their geographical locations and their uh, DNA, how do you ensure that you're on the right side of law? Because in law, a mistake, even by mistake, is a mistake. So how do you ensure that your business practices unknowingly is not crossing any legal boundary? I think it's a very good question. I mean, when I started the company, uh, my CTO, who actually was born in Nigeria, uh, was already in the money transfer industry, if you like. And the first thing I remember saying to him was that the first system you build has to be KYC compliant. It has to look at animant money laundering. You have to be able to identify uh, point to point where the money is actually going and what it's actually being used for. And it's that second bit that is what the uniqueness is what we've built, is that you know, it's what I call purposeful remittance. So it's not about sending money to somebody. It was actually identifying what that money is actually being used for. So today, for example, you know, what we allow people to do is to actually pay someone's bills. So 30% of what people send is normally used to pay simple bills, whether it's utility, it's grocery, it's healthcare, it's schooling. And so what we did was to connect those particular supply points onto the platform, which meant that when you sent a payment, um, you would know exactly what that purpose was. And that's exactly the model we want to bring into India. There are two ways of quick growth for any entrepreneurship. One is adding more number of employees and sp expanding rampantly. Second is adding more vendors or uh, more partners and growing rapidly. Which route have you adopted and why? We, we actually have adopted the, the latter, you know, because it, one thing I learned in banking is trust is the most fundamental feature when you're dealing with money. You know, people are trusting you with their funds. They're trusting you to actually get it to the point where it needs to get to. And you can only build trust through relationships. You know, it's not something that you can just overnight, just because you've got the best product, you've got the cheapest product, that people are going to buy that, you know, which is why if you look at the universal market, people still stick to the traditional lines of sending money because there's a trust factor. So for us, that was fundamental. So we started with two of the largest institutions in Africa um, to actually build the business. And that's what's actually held us in a very good position to actually grow substantially. So you believe in partnerships? We do. Any business expansion news needs a very powerful review mechanism. What is yours? Well, the review starts with the um, standards that the corporate themselves, the partner, is setting on you. And you've got to adhere to those particular standards. It's very painful. Some can take up to two years, which is what's done. If I take South Africa as an example, just getting through the regulators has taken us two years. It's a very painful process, but a very necessary process because, you know, the more challenge you face and you emerge through the challenge, it becomes much easier. So pain at the beginning will bear fruits in the future. If you get fruits too early, you will see pain in the future. So we believe in that pain threshold. What inspires you for doing what you're doing? As I said, it's that community. It's that sense of giving uh, and that consciousness of actually making sure you're doing something that's going to benefit the people that need it most. So you believe in social entrepreneurship? Absolutely. And how do you communicate this through your business model? We communicate that through two, uh, three elements. It's sort of cost, convenience, and control in the way we actually empower people to actually use the service itself. But we, what we are doing also is we've changed the business model and we're trying to prove to the community that there is an alternate way. Through use of technology, you can bring your cost of manufacture down. So in a typical manufacturing company, they will have raw materials that go into it. In a banking business, it's intellectual. So once you've built the platform and it's fit for purpose, your cost of manufacture can drop quite significantly, if you like. So we've added a new cost to our raw material, and that's actually a sense of giving. So we are going to commit to give 10% of our revenue into a social foundation that will benefit education, 
health programs into the country where the money is actually flowing. So it's a new way of looking at uh, what is called corporate social responsibility. It's not responsibility in words and wisdom, but it's through actions of your fundamental business model. And that's how we intend delivering it. So friends, uh, Dakshesh, the business model that he conducts is a com company called Zimpe. And Zimpe is a very unique concept with zero competition across the world where money can travel from one country to the other country and can be used for paying utilities like education, medical, light bills, water bills, all kind of utility services can be paid. So a son working in London can earn in London and pay, some, to pay his family bills in India seamlessly and effortlessly irrespective whether the family in India has a bank account or not. So the money can reach even to people who don't have a bank account back home in any country. It might be somebody working in London and uh, staying in Zimbabwe, it can happen. Uh, this is a very interesting business model where you are not having any competition. What according to you is competition? Does it help your growth or having competition is good or not having competition is good? What do you think about competition? I think competition is always um, healthy and it's more about um, collaboration if you like. So even companies that um, will enter the space. So we quite often get, um, you know, benchmarked against how do we stack up with Western Union, Asimo, World Remit, the new sort of digital remittance companies, if you like. And, and our view is very simple, is that, you know, people must be given the choice. It's not up to us to determine what people want. Our role is to ensure that we provide the services that people want. And competition's healthy because it keeps you it keeps that tension, it keeps us at the sort of cutting edge and makes sure that we keep thinking, we keep delivering uh, against that particular promise. Since your enterprise is growing on partnerships and collaborations, what are your recent experiences in terms of your insights of collaborative working? Because a lot of people are very averse to collaborative working. So what can be your insights which can motivate people for growing through collaborations? I think it's, uh, you, you've got to take it country at a time and culture at a time. You know, if I took India, India was a very interesting journey for us, you know, because um, coming to India, you can have a conversation that seems left, but the thinking of the corporate is right. So you never know whether actually what you're saying and they're nodding in a room, whether they're in agreement with you or whether they're just taking in knowledge, if you like. And I think it's, you, you've got to take certain risks in, in your business model. When we went to Nigeria, it's very similar. And there, the cultural fit is you've got to think like a Nigerian to do business like a Nigerian. You know, when you're going to India, it's more about the responsibility that the corporate is actually laying. You know, their own reputation is quite fundamental. Um, so for India, for example, the sector we looked at was healthcare. And, you know, we see healthcare as a very significant growth area in India. It's the fastest growing market probably globally. It's growing at 30% a year. Uh, and the big uh, buzz in India today is medical tourism. Um, today in India it's $4 billion. In three years it will be $8 billion. And there's very significant growth um, that's coming through. The marriage we're bringing is our expertise in Africa. Because the biggest channel of growth into India for medical services is from Africa. And how is that happening? It's much like the real estate discussion we had um, earlier, if you like. With wealth comes affluence. With affluence comes choices. So we are spoiled as creatures of habit, if you like. And so what's happening in Africa is this renaissance that as people are becoming more affluent in the middle class, they're demanding better services, whether it's education, it's health. And India provides that solution uh, to sort of the new Africa, if you like. And our role in that was actually solving the payment problem, that how do you get that payment from Africa into India? And what we've done in the case of Nigeria, for example, and into India with the largest health provider, uh, Apollo Group, is to actually arrange for their patients to pay in their home country for service in a foreign country. So the analogy I use um, in, in the way we're setting it out is imagine rivers going into an ocean. So rivers all have their own challenges, they have their own tributaries, they have their own way in which they meander, but ultimately when they hit the ocean, they're one with the ocean. They lose their identity, they're one. So for us, payments is the same thing. It doesn't matter where you are, and what you do, if you want to make a payment, you should have the right to do it wherever you are, whenever you want.